I'm here today to talk to you about the ins and outs of community service in a little story about Inside Out. Now, Inside Out is both the name of a project that's grown from a seed planted nearly three years ago, but it also describes perfectly how I got to be here today in front of all of you. It's a lens that has allowed me to seek strength in my vulnerability, to pursue my passion, and to listen to the voice of authenticity within, even when it speaks in barely a whisper. I'd like to invite you back into my life a little over a year ago on a sultry summer evening. I was at a gathering with a group of friends, and in between voraciously eating salt and vinegar chips, I managed to corner one of my friends, and instead of talking to him like a socially functioning human being about sports or the weather, I'd started interrogating him about the meaning of life. Luckily, my friends are used to this, knowing that they have a philosophy student in the midst. I was perfectly comfortable with the conversation, as long as the pressure was on my friend. But when he turned the question back around on me, I was taken aback, and I didn't quite know what to say. At that point, I was registered for a full semester of philosophy classes at UVic. I loved my classes, but I was slowly finding myself more and more disengaged from my education. In the back of my mind, I kept remembering that philosophy is just not a practical degree. I mean, when you study engineering, you become an engineer, but when you study philosophy, you don't exactly graduate and enter the workforce as a full-time philosopher in quite the same regard. So I had decided to do the only practical thing <clears throat> that I knew how to do with the humanities education. I decided to study law. Now, this isn't because I looked at my future and pictured my dazzling legal career, but I wanted to study law because I imagined myself at future gatherings just like the one where I was, where people would ask me, what do you do? And I just imagined that I would swirl my Chardonnay around and say, oh, me? I study law. And everyone would think, she's so smart, she's so successful, even in spite of her artsy-fartsy degree, that girl really made it. And that was the most important thing to me at the time. But when my friend looked me squarely in the eyes and asked me, what do you want to do with your life? I couldn't say the superficial truth. So something deep within me bubbled up instead. And to this day, I'm not sure where it came from. I told him, I want to be the executive director of an organization that promotes youth mental health. At the point that I told my friend this, he probably knew that I'd grown up with a mother with schizophrenia. But I'm sure that he had no idea the extent of the darkness I'd seen with mental illness in my life. I had to watch my beautiful and brilliant mother slip out of touch with reality. And as reality slipped, it took with it my fundamental belief that the world was a safe and okay place. Suddenly, nothing was in my control. This feeling of rootlessness only magnified as I entered foster care in my teens. And as humans eventually do, I adapted. I'd adapted so much so, in fact, that when I left foster care at the age of 19, I felt like water. I could take the shape of any vessel into which I was poured, but when left on my own, I was formless. It wasn't until years later when I had a home of my own, my very own mildewy, dusty little basement suite, that I began to look at my fragmented family and to search for those questions that I had been avoiding for so long. I searched and searched, and when I finally found what I was looking for, something in me started to heal. What I learned is that schizophrenia is a biological illness, 
much like asthma or diabetes or anything else. When I realized this, I had a big epiphany moment because for the first time I realized that I didn't cause my mom's mental illness, I couldn't cure it, and I couldn't really change anything. The only thing over which I had any control was myself. It was so much easier to blame others and to play the victim, but when I realized that my happiness was in my own hands, I was terrified. So when my friend asked me on that day what I wanted from life, I thought about the two pilot projects that I'd implemented in my community. They were psychoeducation and support groups for youth who have parents with mental illness. They were projects that took the very adversity I'd experienced and made it into action. They were very well received, not only by the youth themselves, but by the community at large. They brought me so much purpose that I'd never had. But yet, when my friend asked me that question, what do you want from life, I kept clinging desperately to how I was perceived by other people, rather than what I knew to be my purpose. At this point, I had to reflect very honestly about my experience of university. And I'll tell you that I was born with a genetic illness called cystic fibrosis, or CF. CF affects all the systems in my body, but in particular, my pancreas and lungs. In fact, it's even earned me the nickname Lil Wheezy amongst my friends for my chronic cough, which I'm told is charming, by the way. <laughs> but this affected my ability to participate in school because when I looked at it honestly, I realized that I'd spent more times in hospitals and lecture halls, and I'd filled out more academic concession sheets than test scores. If my nickname was Lil Wheezy, then my university theme song was definitely Drop It Like It's Hot. <laughs> the best way that I've heard CF described is if you plug your nose and breathe through a straw. So you can imagine that that affected how I planned my day-to-day -day life. But it also affected how I looked at the future as a whole. Many wonderful treatments exist for CF, but the life expectancy is still barely into the 40s, and as it remains today, there's no cure. So when my friend asked me, what do you want from life, I realized the absurdity of wasting my precious time and energy living up to what I perceived to be someone else's expectation of me. I already had, at my very fingertips, something which gave me passion and purpose. So, I did something that I really hope you won't tell your parents, and parents in the room, I apologize in advance, but I did the best thing I could have done, and I dropped out of school. I think the only thing more flaky than a philosophy student is a philosophy dropout. <laughs> but I, I went there, I went right to the gutter. And I took that year off to work on volunteering for the social issues that really mattered to me, the ones that I knew deeply and that got me out of bed in the morning. It was really difficult to let go of that role of student because I realized what a placeholder I had become in my life. During that difficult time, I thought often of the words of another famous dropout who had also had to confront his mortality. I'm sure by now you all know by heart the words of the late, great Steve Jobs. He said, remembering that you're going to die soon is the best way of avoiding the trap of thinking you have something left to lose. You're already naked. There's no reason not to follow your heart. So, as terrified as I was, that's exactly what I did. I, without any knowledge of facilitation or fundraising or finance, 
I delved into growing that project, growing that seed of community action, and seeing where it would take me. I realized that by letting go of the lesser things, I made room for really great things. I secured a few grants, and we all know money makes the world go round. I worked alongside some of my mental health heroes, and I met my graphic designer, who's now my friend, Graham. And he gave me the gift of this beautiful logo behind me. There are a few possible transliterations of the word logo, and I've chosen the one that best suits me, so don't look it up, because it might be wrong. But logo means meaning. So when Graham gave me this logo, he gave such a layer of meaning to what I was doing. Like I said, Inside Out describes not only the organization that I'm working so hard right now to build, but it's also the path of how I got to be here today. I had to look deep within myself, very often finding things that I didn't like. But it's really only in that place of vulnerability that I found my true power. I think of another TEDx talk that I really love, and it's such an honor to be a part of this one today. But I just want to tell you all that you don't have to have it all figured out in order to affect change in the community. I certainly didn't. And what the speaker reminded me is that Martin Luther King, in his inspiring speech to the world, he didn't say, I have a plan. What he said simply was, I have a dream. So I found that I'm not afraid anymore to dream big. And I always start that by looking deep within myself. It's only from there that I've managed to turn insight into action and to transform my life from the inside out.